So welcome everyone. Just a couple of quick introductions. We have uh, Tamara Napperberger joining us from our home base at the Emerson tonight. Courtney Bazan, our artist, joining us from Missoula. Hello. I'm Susan Denson Guy, the executive director at the Emerson, and welcome to my living room. It's one of the pleasures of COVID is that we get the opportunity to meet and see everybody in new and different spaces. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight and joining us as we listen to part two of Courtney Blazon's uh, presentation. We get to meet the cast of characters this evening. As we mentioned, we wanna make sure that everybody's cameras are off, your microphones are off. And before we go any further this evening, we'd like to pause. We'd like to pause to acknowledge that the Emerson Center for the Arts and Culture occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Absaliga, the Salish Kootenai, the Cheyenne. We honor all of the indigenous caretakers of these lands, waters, and the elders who lived here before, the indigenous of today, and the generations to come. At this time, we'd like to invite each of you to follow the link that we posted in the chat and just acknowledge the lands that you're joining us from this evening. Last week, we had folks joining us from several countries and from across the United States. And Courtney, I'd like to hand it over to you. Welcome, welcome, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, A Year Without a Summer, and we're gonna focus this time on the cast of characters. Um, and the main cast of characters I've illustrated in the bigger pieces. So if you're in last week's talk, or if you've seen the work in the gallery, then you will have seen the huge um, drawings that I did and there's a whole cast of characters involved in those big drawings and I'm going to start first with a character who actually wasn't alive during the year without a summer but who had a surprisingly um, potent um, shadow over the whole event so I'm just going to quickly read um, this little blurb about Benjamin Franklin in 1783 a volcanic fissure in Iceland erupted with enormous force, pouring out cubic kilometers of lava. Layers of poisonous ash snowed down upon the island. The grass died and three quarters of the livestock starved to death, followed by the quarter of the, a quarter of the people. A peculiar haze shadowed Western Europe for months. Benjamin Franklin, visiting France, noticed the unusual cold that summer and speculated that it might have been caused by the volcanic fog that visibly dimmed the sun, sunlight. In 1784, he wrote meteorological imaginations and conjectures and presented his findings to the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society. Franklin's speculation was the first time that volcanoes and meteors had been suggested at the, as the cause of climate change. It was not received with any seriousness by the society members. However, it proved to be correct. So like many things, um, Benjamin Franklin was well ahead of his time. And so I thought he was a, a key component in this, even if it meant he was a sort of specter over the whole event of 1816. And there were even people in America and beyond who believed that perhaps if he hadn't been experimenting with electricity earlier, that, um, that perhaps his experiments with electricity had caused some glitch in the system, so to speak, and that maybe that was why things were going so awry. And that's also not the truth. So that's Benjamin Franklin. Now the four main characters, um, and they're really the four people that got me hooked into this um, sort of whole drama are Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, and John Polidori. Now I'm gonna go through them and I'm gonna try to do it kind of quickly. If you have any additional questions, you can put them in, a, in the chat. Um, but this was the piece I did um, called The League of Incest. And this illustrates um, their experience in 1816 on Lake, Lake Geneva in Switzerland, where they um, basically birthed Gothic horror. And um, Mary Shelley, um, sorry, I'm getting a call. So I'm like, get out of here. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, Mary Shelley um, wrote the beginnings of Frankenstein. So I'll start with Mary Shelley. 
Um, she shows up in a few of my pieces. As you can see, I take creative license with how I draw people. It's a general idea. Um, I'm definitely more concerned with other aspects of the story rather than continuity of facial features. Um, but she lived to be the oldest of the crew, I would say, at 54. Um, she was born Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, and her parents were both political philosophers. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, who you might recognize, um, was the author of a fem feminist manifesto, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. And she was not in Mary's life because she died at Mary's birth. Um, so her father, William Godwin, was her sole caretaker. Um, she met um, Percy Shelley when she was 15 and he was 20. And he was somebody who spent a lot of time at her father's salons. Um, he had literary salons. That's also where she first heard Samuel Taylor Coleridge um, recite the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And as you can see in this piece, I've used this, the, the symbols of the albatross um, as sort of the, and if you've read the rhyme of the ancient mariner, you know that um, he used albatross as a, as a vignette in that. Um, but this piece kind of explores her younger life, including those albatross. And then um, when Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley were, were meeting secretly, they would meet at the gravestone of her mother. Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, they did run off together um, in 1814 and she became pregnant out of wedlock and it was quite scandalous. Um, and I'm just looking at my notes here, but there's so much to say about her, so I'll move on. Um, so that's kind of her younger years. Um, her older years um, still, so, still flanked with the albatross, but this time a little darker. Um, she survived three of her four children. Um, she lost Percy Shelley um, to a drowning accident when he was 27. Um, and she had, but through it all, she had a very sad life, but through it all, she, she wrote, and that was her way of coping. Um, the little heart in the box, and I did a lot of research on this, and as far as I can tell, it was true. She kept, um, she kept Shelley's heart um, wrapped in the last poem he wrote, um, Ad Adonis, um, in her writing desk. And so that's that. Another sort of piece of that gothic horror story. Um, she did have one child who, who survived her when she died at 54. So that's sort of the, the touchstones of her. Now, when she wrote um, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, which was published in 1818, but which had its genesis in 1816. She described Frankenstein's monster as an eight foot tall, hideously ugly creation with translucent, translucent yellowish skin pulled so taut over the body that it barely disguised the workings of the arteries and muscles underneath. Watery glowing eyes, flowing black hair, black lips and prominent white teeth. So as you can see, her vision for Frankenstein was wildly different from what we see as Frankenstein's monster now. And um, I wanted to, in one of my portraits, sort of draw him as I saw her words creating him. So that's my attempt at what he might have looked like in my imagination. Now, we're more familiar with the Boris Karloff version, which completely missed the point of um, what Mary Shelley was going for. And Mo Frankenstein's monster was a very intelligent creature, uh, very, very full of pathos and pain. And although Boris Karloff did bring some of that into Frankenstein's monster, it got rid of his ability to speak. And that's a really important part of her uh, book. Now, this is just another sort of um, offshoot of, of the, you know, the Hollywood version of the Frankenstein's monster is the bride. Um, moving on to Mary Shelley, or per per Percy Shelley, who, as you can see, only lived to be 27, 28, almost 28. Um, he, 
And I just, I do have to look at my notes because there's so many things about each person, but he was considered one of the finest poets, even in his young, his small amount of time on earth. Um, and he's known for things like To the Skylark, Ozymandias, um, Mont Blanc, which is one that he wrote after a walk in that summer of 1816 with Mary, who was then called Mary Godwin and Claire Claremont. Um, and um, he had a, he was a very romantic man with a lot of passions, but really his main passion was writing. And so he and, and Mary Shelley form, formed a really beautiful, albeit short alliance in their young lives. Um, he, I'm not sure what else to say about him. I might just go ahead and move on, but everything in these pieces I maybe should just mention are symbols from his life. So you'll see the volcano in the back before the, the summer of 1816, he was fascinated by volcanoes and was really interested in Mount Vesuvius and um, had a lot of things to say about volcanoes. Um, Claire Claremont was um, Mary Shelley's half sister and she was deeply in love with Byron. And according to what I've read, she seduced him um, and was became pregnant with his child. Um, he um, insisted that the child go with him. She gave him a child. The child then was put in a nunnery and then passed away at five. And so she never forgave um, Byron for um, that. And she never had another child, but she did live to be um, in her 80s. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft is Mary's mother, and um, there's a, lo a lot to say about her, but I won't say too much. Um, she remains a specter throughout Mary Shelley's life, um, although Mary didn't know her, um, and um, she's a really important figure in feminist literature and feminist thinking. Um, and we're going to move on to Lord Byron. Hopefully I'm going at a clip that we'll get through everything, but not too fast that I'm jumping over. Great, too Courtney. Much, but You're doing great. Great. Okay. So here's Lord Byron and um, he showed up a few times in the bigger pieces of work. And um, he, as you can see from, he lived to be 36. So he had a really short life, a very, very, very exciting life, um, for sure. Um, he was a lord. Um, this piece explores his young life. He was a lord by the time he was 10, but he inherited very little. He inherited a title and he inherited this sort of um, dissolving abbey where he lived with his mother. And um, he had a club foot, which is pretty interesting because he was considered so handsome and so um dapper that he 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 always felt really conscientious or self-conscious about his um club foot and um oh whoops um and so this piece kind of explores his young life he was despite his um physical limitations he was a boxer he he played in the cricket team um he was an he was a what is the term anyway he was a gambler um even at a young age um but he always loved animals and that was a big part of his life and it it showed up in every every narrative about him was his love of people sexually and then his love of animals as a human being and um he just had a zeal for life, I suppose. Um, he was always a he was always a writer, and he remained a writer his entire entire life. Um, Don Juan is one of his most well known um, pieces. Um, where is my little thing about him? Um, and this piece is called Mad, Bad, and Dangerous to Know. And that was coined about him by Lady Caroline Lamb, who was one of, one of his lovers. Um, he had so many that there's actually a book out there that is illustrated and quite beautiful. Um, that's called The Many Loves of Byron. And I have a beautiful copy of it. Um, and when he did, he did die um, 
when he was 36, he died in Greece and he was actually a patriotic hero there. He'd um, fought for the resistance um, and his, so he, he always loved Greece and then um, he was quite, he was quite well regarded there. Um, the reasons he was in um, uh, Switzerland for that summer had a lot to do with the fact that he had fallen quite out of favor for the different exploits he'd been on. So this piece is, is kind of more of a memorialization of the latter part of his years. I did want to mention just before I move on, um, Mary or Percy Shelley and Lord Byron had as much of a love for each other as Percy Shelley had with Mary Shelley. And in fact, Percy Shelley's boat that he drowned on was called Don Juan after um, Shelley. Although they didn't get to see each other a lot um, just because, you know, travel wasn't that easy. And uh, Lord Byron was not a wealthy Lord. He was uh, somebody who had a lot of debts. And so he, you know, he was pretty settled into Greece at the time. So um, I just wanted to celebrate some of his more um, Byronic accomplishments in this piece. So this is Lady Caroline Lamb who wrote um, of him, Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know. Um, she was a, a beautiful writer on her own and, and one of her novels was actually the genesis of the vampire novel that Polidori would write, um, which is a little convoluted. Um, I'll get back to that. Um, Therese Giacchioli, um was the love of Byron's life and uh, she, she wrote about him until she died um, as her the love of her life. Um, and Ada Lovelace, I don't know if this is ringing a bell, but um, Byron's first wife, whose name I cannot remember off the top of my head, um, he and her, he, she and he had a baby named Ada Lovelace, and Byron had nothing to do with her in her life, but she went on to be a, a brilliant mathematician and wrote the first sort of modern thing that we think of as computer code. So she's a really cool figure on her own and is definitely worthy of her own um, illustration. And she lived, she was very, very young when she passed away as well. And I believe from breast cancer. Um, so that's kind of the Byron story. Now, John Polidori, Dr. John Polidori, he was, he was on the, the trip with this crew, crew, um, because he was the, the doctor of Byron and, he, he, he was a doctor, but he considered himself a poet and a writer. Um, he was also a terrible gambling addict, quite addicted to um, alcohol and uh, quite lovelorn. He was desperately in love with um, Mary Shelley. And there's a story in one of the books that I read that said that he um, loved her so much that he had a, a bouquet of flowers and he do he dove off of a ledge to deliver them to her only to break his ankle which in every story I read about Polidori is kind of the flavor of them now he died really quite young um 20 26 27 um from accidental or or on purpose poisoning um he was quite in debt and he never uh, really rose to the levels of, of fame that his contemporaries did, Shelley, both Shelley's and Byron. So he wrote um, The Vampire during this period in 1816, and it was consistently um, credited, credited with being um, Byron. My, my, my dogs are just having a field day um, running around to distract me. So I'm sorry about that. Um, the Vampire was published in April of 1819, written by John Polidori, but was inc incorrectly attributed to Lord Byron upon first release. 
The vampire is often viewed as the progenitor of the romantic vampire genre of fantasy fiction. The work is described as the first fully first story successfully to fuse the disparate elements of vampirism into co a coherent literary genre. So he he did that, um, and it was often credited to Lord Byron. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the novel that um, Lady Caroline Lamb wrote. And I'm not going to get into, I thought I would get into it, but now I'm seeing that that seems silly. So um, you can find more information about it. Um, I think in the educational stuff that I have at the gallery, um, but this is the sort of portrait of the vampire as um, it was envisioned by John Polidori very and it's it's sort of what we see now it's like a very romantic very handsome um, youthful hypnotic kind of man um, and then I wanted to do as I did with the Franken Frankenstein's monster a few more modern um, interpretations of that so you've got Nosferatu um, from a I, I believe from a play he was kind of imagined this way from from a play initially and then from the drier film of 19 some year in the 20s or 30s and then Bella Lugosi as Dracula who's the you know another one I want to suck your blood kind of guy so those are the two um so those were the main characters and I know I'm just kind of flying through them but got a lot to get through. So this is Stanford Ra Raffles. And if you were at my first talk or if you've seen the show in the Jesse Wilbur, then you, you recognize him from being in the piece about the eruption of Volcano Tambora. And he was, I mean, he's a really interesting guy in his own right. He's in my story um, because he was on Java and he witnessed and, and wrote about the eruption of the volcano. He went on to do some really cool things. Um, he was he was the founder of the London Zoo. He wrote the history of Java, um, a lot of really cool things. He did have an orangutan who he dressed up in a little sailor suit. So I could not miss an opportunity to show that. Um, this is Heinrich Hein. So if you were if you were in my talk last week, I read the, he was a journalist. And he, he wrote the passage about um, cholera taking over Europe in 1832. So that's what his, um, he's kind of known for. Beyond that, he was a journalist of, of um, a lot of good reputation, but that's why he's in this body of work. Li Yu Yang is the poet who lived in the Yunnan province. And um, he re, in sort of reinvented, reinvented the poetry of the seven sorrows. And the poetry of the seven sorrows is something I really responded to in making this body of work um, because um, the plight of the, the Chinese people in the Yunnan province was really well documented. And because of the rice crop failure during the summer of 1816, um, a lot of the farmers began farming opium, and by 1819, 1820, a lot of them were addicted to their own crop. And he, in his young life, very young life, um, wrote the poetry of the sevens, reinvented it so that he could speak to the pain that his people were going through. And I really encourage you to, to seek out his work if you can find it. There's not much there, but it's really, really powerful. And he was a scholar who went home to farm with his family when they were suffering and then became a poet um, because he needed to, to speak the truth about his people. This is J.M.W. Turner. And he is the painter of the skies. And so I, I'm sure some of you have seen some of these paintings. What's interesting is he didn't do these all in that period of time. He did a lot of sketching during 1816 and made a lot of these paintings post-1816. But you can see that the colors in, in the skies um, and, and sort of the, there's so much drama and so much, so much intensity and he was really seeing what was happening 
um, the gaseous clouds in the atmosphere and what they were doing um, to the atmosphere. I said atmosphere twice, I think, sorry. Um, so I, he's a really important figure and he shows up in my large piece, Details sur la fin de mon, and he and in that he's painting the actual sky of my piece. Um, he had a brilliant career, very well respected landscape painter. Um, so that's JMW Turner. Um, this is Ignace Vanets, and he was actually, I mean, it, it, he was actually the sort of the the first person who really developed. Um, glaciology. So he was living in Switzerland and because of the freezing of the, my dog is just going bananas, which is crazy. I'm so sorry. Um, because of the, the, the melting of all the glaciers in Switzerland during the summer of 1816, um, there was a ton of really, 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 um, dramatic flooding and it would wipe out towns. And so Ignace Vanets really developed, he was an engineer um, and really became invested in gl glacial science. And so he, he developed a system to, um, and I'm not a scientist, so I'm not gonna say this co totally correctly, but he developed a, a system to tunnel through the glaciers and subvert some of the flooding so that it wouldn't um, wipe out so many people and so many towns. I think he was pretty successful. Anyway, that's sort of the birth of it is that period of 1816, 1817, um, when people were really suffering. And Switzerland had a, a lot of, um, lots of tragedy during that period with crop failure and starvation and disease. This is Luke Howard, and he actually, I mean, this sounds poetic and kind of silly, but as far as I've read about, as much as I've read about him, it seems like he just sort of wandered around staring up at the clouds, and I mean, he's just called the namer of the clouds, but during this period of 1816, and sort of the months afterwards, the, the clouds were so dramatic that he had a lot to work with, so a lot of his cloud naming happened during this period, which I mean, and I will just mention a lot of these people don't have photos or they don't have um, images that I can pull from for reference. So I'm just making it up. But I just thought he seemed sort of dreamy. I like the idea of somebody walking around romantically naming the clouds. Um, and so that's Luke Howard. <laughs> Um, this is Lord Francis Rowden Hastings, and he was in India at the very beginning of what became the cholera epidemic in India. And I felt it was important to just show some of the, the people who maybe were in positions of power during that time. Um, he was one of the ones that, and I, for, you know, for some reason, I cannot remember more about him. So I can go back to him if I can remember more, but um, he was an important figure just in terms of dealing with um, the cholera epidemic happening during British rule in India. This is William Scoresby. Now he's somebody who's sort of tangentially related to the year without a summer um, because of the melting of the ice during the summer of 1816 and then sort of the subsequent warming of just the whole planet. Um, the Northwest Passage was open in a way that it had never been before. And Scoresby, whose father was also Scoresby, was um, somebody who was, uh, he was an adventurer. And so it was because of the melting of that summer that he was able to sort of, um, go into the Northwest Passage and do more exploring. Um, as you can see, the portraits range from like being, you know, involved in the period of 1816 in terms of like being right there. And then also sort of the bigger framework. I mean, really I could have, had I had the time, I could have done a hundred portraits of people who were sort of all around, you know, if it's a gaseous cloud of, um, of, of, volcanic dust, then 
there, there's a lot of people around that. So these are just some that I thought were interesting. Now, Joan Keats was a poet at the time, a contemporary of um, Shelley, a contemporary of Byron, and he wrote some really important poems. Also somebody, uh, this whole group of, you know, romantic Gothic poets, um did not live long lives kind of like the rock stars of today or of today i mean like the 60s and 70s but um so he was chan you know tangentially related but still somebody i thought was important and because my interest in this body of um work had so much to do with writers um I, he felt important for me to include in there um, this is Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, who uh, he he was a real sad sack, I would say, from everything I've read about him, a brilliant, brilliant writer and poet. And, you know, Mary Shelley um, was so um, inspired by the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Um, and then also he wrote Kubla Khan, which he wrote during the period of 1816. And if you go back and read Kublai Khan, um, I think has a lot of relationship to what was going on politically, uh, economically, in the climate, and so forth. Um, he was a he was addicted to laudanum and uh, had a hard time finishing projects. He wasn't just a procrastinator; he just could not. He just start and then just lose himself and and drink and very very sad fellow but he he didn't he lived longer than some of my other poets um this is john james audubon and i have to say that um john james is really i don't actually know that the earth out of summer affected him but he was alive during that period and he was super active you know collecting his birds and drawing all the beautiful drawings that we have um, of the birds of america and i can't imagine that the period of that of of 1816 when he was doing that that he wasn't somehow affected by the weather and i don't know if that means more birds were around if less birds were around if it was easier for him to find specimens because according to what i read about america at the time like it wasn't unusual to find whole whole broods of birds dead from the weather because of the rot radical changes in the weather um so he's the last one i feel like i went really fast because i was nervous about going slow so courtney you did amazing you did okay. amazing and i'm gonna listen uh just a reminder please drop any questions that you have in the chat and then i have a couple of questions for you as well um, okay and i can go back to i can go back to slides too if you want me to while we talk i have cheats oh good job so Courtney, I think it's amazing when um, for folks that are in the Emerson and they see your body of work in the Jesse and in the lobby galleries. Um, two things, if you could just tell folks a little bit about the amount of time that you spent creating this massive body of work, or should I say this, this moment in time that right. you've been creating uh, this work. And then also the, the media, because I think it's a I can't paint my way out of a box, let alone try and, you know, draw a circle. Um, and so to, just to tell a little bit about what you, what you use to make the images. Yeah, I might go back to, maybe I'll go back to the big piece so we can look at it. That might be a nice backdrop. Sorry if I'm making anybody dizzy, yep. um, but it might be nice to just go back to this big piece. So first I'll say, you know, I read uh, the book that is called The Year Without a Summer by a father and son duo who are meteorologists, and I can't remember their names um, because I can only remember half my details, I feel like, but um, I read it in, this, it in one summer, and I really got excited about it, and I developed the concept over about six months, and then I had from May until September to finish every piece of work. So that that was about four months. That's about four months. And the I would say the pieces that you see in the Jesse Wilbur, plus the six narrative portraits of Byron, Shelley, other Shelley, 
and Polidori. I did those in about three months and three weeks. And then I had a week left. And so I did all those portraits you see on the wall, um, which was kind of crazy. So all together, I mean, for the big pieces, um, the eight foot drawings, this one that you're looking at right now took me 350 hours. Um, the one called Poetry of the Seven Sorrows took me about 250 hours. Um, and then it went down as I ran out of time. But the the four foot paintings each took me about 100 hours each. So if somebody's doing the math there, but <laughs> um, I, I jammed a lot. I always called it my, my own year without a summer because I, I didn't do anything but that. Um, I didn't, yeah. And yeah. then, which is, which is amazing and awe-inspiring. Yeah. So you did all of it in a short window of time, probably with little, little sleep, but then also right. what did you use to actually create the work? Yeah. So the pieces that are the portraits, those are all mylar, um, a pen and pen and uh, colored pencil on mylar. And then I, as much as I could, I found antique wallpaper. And then in the cases that I couldn't find antique wallpaper that suited it, I would use a uh, image I found. Um, so those are all, you know, and I, I like that haunting quality of mylar on something behind it. And it's mylar, not a vellum. Yeah, it's mylar, yeah. yeah. Which I think is the same, like a kind of a frosted mylar. It's very, very smooth. These big pieces are all, except for the sky, you'll see in the sky, it's very uh, expressive, but the rest of it is pen and marker on paper. So it's basically just, it's like me illustrating, just everything's hand-drawn in pen. And then I go over and color it all in with marker. And I, I'll tell you, I used a lot of marker, um, but I have refillable markers. I use Copics and the refillable. So, um, and that's a whole other thing. Cause then at some point during this whole project they had to be refilled and that's like a time consuming process. Um, and then in the sky, I used oil pastel on this one cause I wanted to have that more expressive feel. Um, but other than that, they're all, all pen and marker on paper. So, okay, so it's a, yeah. So back to, back to the portraits. I know that you said you used a lot of artistic license and, you know, I walk by them all multiple times a day and yeah. I kind of keep thinking, okay, who does this look like? Who does this look like? Right. And so when we see this William, I'll just show it briefly here. Yeah. So to me, this is like a cross between like Johnny Cash and James Dean. <laughs> And I actually think William Scoresby is one of the few that actually had an image. So I was able to pull from him, but I can, I can see, I can see I, an old, if James Dean had lived if to be old. If he aged well, right? If he right. aged it's funny and listening to this because I was I'm always intrigued by you know what is factually um pulled from from history and then just pulled from your um, imagination. And then the original. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, now, me, okay. I got a Christopher Walken happening here. Right. Yeah. And like for that particular one, I didn't look at anything. I just tried to use my, my imagination. Um, but yeah, I see, I definitely see Christopher Walken in there, but who knows? I watch so much TV when I draw, who knows what's actually absorbing into my brain. And when you're that sleep deprived, your brain is both like a sponge and then totally resistant. Like it's a combination effect. But all the portraits, so I, I finished all the other pieces of work and then had one week to finish all those portraits. So that was, that was a lot. So I wasn't being too fiddly diddly at that point. Um, I had a sore hand, I'll tell you. I yeah. bet, I bet you did. Yeah. <laughs> Courtney, the other thing that you touched on, and I know you talked about it last week when you're talking about the big body of work, and it's been fun to share with uh, tours that have come through about how you work and about your working environment and how yeah. everything is text-based for you and inspired yeah. by text. Um, but then when you're doing the work itself, you actually have a TV on or the computer playing some visual image. Yeah, it's a, I, I think I get to a point where, so when I'm first developing the, the ideas and, and doing the part that feels like the real work, 
I need to have kind of quiet and I need to really just sit with my thoughts. But once I get down to drawing 96 inches or what's 96 times 40, I, whatever the, the square footage of a piece that is four foot by eight foot, I should be able to do that, but I can't 48 square feet. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not just, I'm not bored so much as just like, it's a slog. Like I, I need to just find a way to get myself through it and being alone in my studio. Um, ha have you ever heard that thing about Alfred Hitchcock where he said, you know, for him, once he gets on set, the actual making of the film is rather boring because he's really visualized it and conceptualized it already on the page. He knows what exactly what he wants. So doing the work of it is work. And I think in some ways I'm a little like that, or at least I was with this project because I knew, I know, I knew it so well. I was so intimately involved in it. I was, it was exciting coloring it in some ways, but it didn't mean that I didn't need distraction because <laughs> um, I had to convince myself somehow to work 20 plus hours a day. And that helped, you know, just going, well, I've got something to keep me company. <laughs> I think that's I think that's amazing and fascinating. And uh, we learned today uh, we, we had a tour through, um, and they'd seen your work. And we talked with them a little bit about your process. And then they were actually able to visit with Jade Louder in person. And Jade's is a lot the same, where he does all the research, gets everything ready to go, and then he's. Uh, shared with the kids today that he likes to talk on the phone as he's doing his painting. Yep. So he'll call. I love it too. You know, I'll I'll talk to my mom on the phone or something, and she'll say, "Oh, go go back to work, get back to work," and I'll go, "Oh, if you think I stopped, you're wrong," because <laughs> I it helps. It's like the it's like a form of you know how some people like to pace when they're on the phone. Yeah, I mean it's like that. It's like, or I mean, I think in some ways I I also like to listen to audiobooks. Be, when I'm drawing, but I, as a student, as a, I mean, even before art school, I remember um, that I needed to be doodling or doing something for information to absorb into my brain. So I think it's something along those lines. Like I absorb information more when I'm somehow divided. Like if that division of my brain is there, which I, I, I don't, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know why that is. Well, but <laughs> I love hearing that. And as a teacher at heart, that's where my training is. I love hearing how people learn and store information right. and, and how they're able to recall it. And I think right. that's a really important thing um, when we look at your work uh, to know that, you know, you can take it all in, but then as you're, as you're developing the piece, you can actually have something else that kind of helps you download. Yeah. Like, exactly. like a trigger to help you release the information. Yep, that's exactly what it is. And like, I'll look at a piece like this and go, okay, I watched like most of West Wing. Like, it'll <laughs> remind me of what I watched when I did it, which is also kind of a funny part of it because it's not related to, I think I watched all of The Wire, all of West Wing, all of Justified. Like I watched a lot of series that summer, um, but. Courtney, Hattie has a question or a comment in the chat and she says, although it's probably overwhelming to think about, haha, do you have plans <laughs> to do a large piece like this again, based on the lives of real people? Not that these aren't real people, because this is history. Yeah. I think she means contemporary people. If so, who um, or a favorite time period would you, uh, would you like to do? Well, um, yeah, it is overwhelming. And in some ways, like I'm, I'm now trying to understand how to get back to that sort of crazy place where I was able to figure out all these connections, but I'm in Missoula and we, I've been, I was in an art residency last summer, um, where I started to do research about, um, the Badlands here, which is basically where um, the brothels and the female boarding houses were. And it was also part of a kind of vital Chinatown we had. And this was the late 1800s, early 1900s. So I'm in the process of recreating um, that street as it was during that period. But it's a lot harder with that pro project because unlike this project where other amazing people had already sort of done a wealth of 
of research that I could pull from, there's not a lot to pull from in terms of um, this piece of history from Missoula. So I've had to be my own investigator, which is really exciting, but also really overwhelming. So I am working on that. There's, um, you know, it's an exciting period here and also one that's totally been erased. Um, but in terms of contem doing contemporary people, I don't, I don't have such a great grasp on what is happening in the world right now. So I think I might just avoid, I think we learned so much about um, how history repeats itself by, look, by looking at our past. And with the year without a summer, like there's so much relationship to our current world that it, it, it's the gift that keeps on giving, but I think I'm not brave enough or wired in enough to like understand things as they're happening. So, but yeah, I am absolutely going to dive into a project like this again. Um, I'm a little scared, but uh, I also don't think I have quite the same stamina that I did during this. Um, I've slowed down just a wee bit. <laughs> Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but Courtney, we're going to call dibs. We just want first dibs. So whenever you're done with this next piece, just let okay. us, give us a little bit <laughs> okay. in here and we will make it happen. Uh, thanks so much for sharing with us tonight. You, did, you just did an amazing job tying all of the folks together. Thank and I know you. one thing I was going to tell you uh, while we have everybody, when we had the tour in today, and the uh, female paleontologist, her name's is eluding me right Mary now. Mary Anning. One of the girls recognized her. Oh, that's so cool. I oh, I love, love that. that. Yeah. She was I like, uh, Tamara was talking about the piece and about the folks and the little girl just, I say little girl, she's eighth grader, just chimed <laughs> in and knew who it was and why she was famous. And like, that is blew, really cool. Blew her teachers away, blew her classmates away. And it was just like a great, like, oh yeah, this is why we do this. So thanks for sharing oh, your work. And that's really cool for inspiring us and, you know, making <laughs> us realize we can do more than just doodles with our markers and colored pens. So, right. Right. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like, I think it's really important for um, non-artists and other artists to know that like pen and marker is, a it's, it can be used really artistically and not just illustrate. And obviously my work is totally illustration, but I think it also is beyond that. I think like, that's a cool thing too. Like I've always gotten a kick out of using kind of not well, not well received art supplies <laughs> um but I'm also not a painter like I am a drawer I'm a drafts person so um I think it's cool especially for kids to know that like you can make really cool work and it can be kind of highbrow even and it can be in a really really humble material so I think that's pretty cool too <laughs> Well, I think it's pretty awesome. And I think you're awesome for doing all this and sharing it with us. So Courtney, Thank thanks you. so much. Thank you. All right, friends. Thanks so much for visiting us. Courtney's work will be uh, on display at the Emerson through mid-November. So please stop by the Emerson. We do require a mask in the galleries at this time. And we're also gonna invite you to join us next Wednesday night via Zoom for Jade Louder's Liminal Spaces Artist Talk. Um, we have a special thing happening, be awesome next week. Uh, we're gonna be joined by Elise Adams with the Bozeman Paranormal Society. And actually we're gonna start the virtual artist talk with a seance next week. So please, <laughs> I know, <laughs> we're kind of equally intrigued and horrified all at the oh same gosh. time. We're super, super looking forward to it. Anyway, thanks so much for being a part of our evening. Courtney, thanks for all you do. Thanks for sharing your work with us. And we look forward Thank to seeing you, you all soon. Thank Good night, you. everybody. Thanks for coming, everyone.